I don't think any fans in the world bring greater fervour or a more self-sacrificing loyalty to the cause than the Scots do. There are, there are enthusiasms that are comparable, such as the, the passion of the Brazilians. Mind you, they've had a wee bit more to sustain them over the years than we have. No, I think, uh, I don't think we're being, we're being outrageous if we say that uh, we have the, the most remarkably committed fans in the whole of football. So intense is the Scottish commitment to the national team that it is claimed to spill over from the terracings into the press box. Scottish football reporters have been accused more than once of colouring their reports, usually dark blue. They have been described as fans with typewriters. I always felt that was rather a, a nice way to describe us. I mean, I, I am a supporter with a typewriter. Uh, you can't travel around the world with Scotland just sitting there and watching and reporting. I mean, you want them to win. I mean, you're, you're there supporting them. I mean, you've got to be objective about what you write, hopefully. But the lovely story that summed it up to me was that we were playing Peru in the World Cup in Argentina, and we got a penalty. If we'd scored the penalty, we'd have beaten Peru, no doubt at all about that. And I was sitting next to a guy who was doing a piece for commercial radio, and he decided he would commentate on this little piece so he could put it into his package later on that night. And Masson came up to take the penalty. And this guy was saying, Don Masson comes up to take the penalty against Peru that could put Scotland into the quarterfinals of the World Cup for the first time in history. Masson, who's never missed a penalty for Scotland. So it's Masson against Caroga, the penalty for Scotland. The next thing that happened was that this guy's microphone came whizzing past my right ear and he's standing in the stand and he's shouting, I always knew he'd miss it! I always knew he'd miss it! And that sums us up, that come the moments of deep emotional crisis when this football team isn't doing what you want it to do. We're not reporters at all, we're just supporters. 69, Ken. Well, I think there's some substance in the accusation. But the fact is that uh, football, in particular, has occupied a place of excessive importance in Scottish life for generations. And the exaggerations in attitude that apply to reporters apply to a lot of people in other areas of life. The national obsession hasn't always had an organisation to match its intensity. In 1954, Uruguay's 7-0 victory reflected differences that weren't confined to the field of play. When we went to the, the World Cup in 54 to Switzerland, uh, we took 13 players with two goalkeepers in the party. <laughs> so, you know, I don't know what the situation was, and we, we had these big grey track suits as if we'd sort of got, borrowed them off the team at Berlin. Uh, it was so funny, like, you know, and we went out there and we were training and we were sweating like nobody's business with these big... And Bobby Collins had done a tracksuit with the fitted George Young and stuff like this, you know. And we were so disorganised, really, that it wasn't true. And we saw these other continental teams like Uruguay and, and, and you know, and people like that and short continental gear and low-cut boots and all the fantastic kit. And we had these big blue jerseys with the big thick collars on them and the big badge and the long sleeves. And <laughs> you'd have thought we were going to the Antarctic rather than going to a football match, like, you know? Things improved. It's hard to see how they could have done otherwise. By the early 60s, the horizons of the Scottish game had widened. The team competed impressively against countries as formidable as Czechoslovakia. There was lots of great players in Scotland at that time. I mean, there was five or six in the Rangers team were great players. Alex Scott was a tremendous player. Davey Wilson was a tremendous player. Jimmy, you know, myself, Billy, Dave Mackay, John White. The, the, tremendous squad of players they had at that time. It's a disgrace that they never, we never really done better. White. Out to Scott, and he's onside. Out in front to White. What a chance here. Scotland can press on the attack. Oh! The talent of the team was beyond question. 
but the professionalism of the Scottish temperament was not. We go to a playoff in Brussels, where we're leading up until about 10 minutes to go. Czechoslovakia equalise, goes into extra time. Paddy Crerand and Jim Baxter, who are pals on and off the park, then have a fight over who gets the water first. And the whole thing goes right off the boil. We lose in extra time. And there you have the whole Scottish psyche involved. Great players, brilliant football, good teams, silly little row. All ends in a shambles. In the qualifying rounds for the 1966 World Cup, Scotland showed that they had become realistic competitors for a place in the finals. They didn't make it, but they had at least served notice of the seriousness of their intentions. By the early 1970s, Scotland's continuing challenge for a place in the finals was even stronger. In defeating East Germany, the team showed greater maturity than they had often done in the past. Much of their self-confidence had come from their manager, Willie Ormond. His classic pre-match pep talk against Sweden. He said, well, go out, do your own thing, play as well as you can. He said, and watch out for the big blonde guy. Ran out of seven big blonde guys. The guy who meant, actually, funnily enough, Edstrom wasn't blonde. But Willie didn't bother much about how the other crowd were going to, what they were going to do. He picked very, very good teams that blended with each other. And to my mind, statistically, he's the best Scottish manager ever. Another corner to Scotland. The whole of Hamden now willing this equaliser to go in. Here comes the goalkeeper. And... Scotland defeated Czechoslovakia to qualify for the 1974 World Cup finals. It had taken a sustained responsibility of purpose to get there, but off the park, the gremlins of irresponsibility could still come out to play. If you're down at Lars for a couple of weeks and it's your night off, there's not much you can do down at Lars, so you've got to make your own entertainment, and that's what we did. So I'd say about 10 or 12 of us, walking along the front, we, and we go over to the front at Lars, you know, there's no beach, there's pebbles, etc. you know, so we get on and we, Jimmy Johnson, gets on. You know, now it's about half a dozen of us, and we, Jimmy, gets in this boat, Believe it or not, I pushed Jimmy out. <laughs> and uh, oh, there was funny stories about that. You know, I remember he couldn't get back in and he was singing his head off. Uh, Sammy was telling me, was he the one that, that shoved me out? He didn't know the rest of it, did he? No. We were actually playing Rangers the following weeks. Sandy was trying to get rid of me. Nobody knows that, by the way. And the next thing, he's 20 yards. I say, you bet. And now he's 50 yards. It's like nothing. I say, hey, Jimmy, you better come back. That's me, David Hay, I think uh, Pat Stanton. And now he's 100 yards. I say, hey, Jimmy, <laughs> come back and you know, oh, he's wrong. So two other players who remain nameless went out to try and get him. And they started to paddle out. And the boat had a hole in it, and that started to sink. <laughs> and now he's a wee dot on the horizon. Now he disappears completely. I don't, I don't believe it. Of course, with the noise we were making, I think we woke up a few people. And of course, everything escalated. You know, it was just a bit of high spirits. Willie Armand's out at the front, and we get the Coast Guard, you know? <laughs> Para Handy coming out of the harbour. And eventually, you know, they get him back, and, uh, you know something? If any Celtic supporter had seen him, they'd have killed him. He was completely blue. <laughs> you know, it was absolutely freezing, completely blue, head to toe, you know? Jimmy Johnson's flair for doing the unexpected was sadly not to be seen on the field during the 1974 World Cup finals. He was to stay on the bench throughout Scotland's games in West Germany. Scotland trying to work a position. Jordan. Lorimer. 1-0. Bremner with a kick. Jordan's made a move. And for the goalkeeper, 2-0. David Hay. That's a good one by Hay. Rivellino, if he gets this goal felt from Lorimer, will feel it. It's a great one. What a shot. There's not much he really could do about that. He was running in on it. It was so near. Well, this is number 18 going through, and Jai flying dangerously here. Danny McGrain. That's a good one. It's a goal. Good run by Hutchison. 
And it's yours to go. Willie Orman's achievement had been considerable. Having taken Scotland to the finals, he saw them through three games without defeat. Scotland had beaten Zaire and drawn with Brazil and Yugoslavia. 